there's plenty going on in regard to that field, I'm more, or let alone that uh, we're seeing those kind of stressors or changes in regard to the mutations with other mutations as well. And let's move on to IDH1. And uh, let's start before we go into the therapy per se, but uh, there has been some reporting, and admittedly some of it came from our institution at Sloan Kettering, is that like an IDH1 can be stressed out too. Your thoughts on that? Yeah, IDH1 is a really frequent, more frequent yeah. mutation in, uh, in intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. So we can find around 20-25% of patients with IDH1. So uh, yeah, I think uh, that's, that's really good news because it's a new target. Yeah, absolutely. And in other words, a change from the IDH1 to IDH2 can occur per se. But before we go there, uh, Andrea, back to you. So, so what's IDH1? What does it do? Yeah, so it's really, um, you know, targeting the cell metabolism. Yeah. You know, the TCA cycle is targeting yeah. the isocitric dehydrogenase. Yes. And so when you have an inhibitor, you kind of block it and you have more produced of alpha keto, what is that? Keto yeah, the alpha glutarate <laughs> that actually push into more 2-hydroxyglutarate mm -hmm. And the two hydroxyglutarate being the oncometabolite that can cause oncogenic changes. And you're right, actually, there's some kind of competition that can occur between two hydroxyglutarate and alpha hydroxyglutarate, enough that really can hijack the tumors or quote unquote those cells that are becoming a tumor per se. So, with this said, uh, Andrew, you were involved quite a bit and we proudly did this together. Uh, tell us a little bit about the uh, already reported data from the phase one study slash two that had a cohort of cholangiocarcinoma on. Yeah, so you know, in the phase one study, when we subject the first IDH you know, inhibit her in this population, uh, we're actually able to observe, you know, a very, very impressive disease control rate in this population. And also, you know, there are patients achieving radiological responses as well. But more importantly, they seem to actually alter the disease stabilization. So the median PFS was very reasonable. But also interestingly, if you look at the tail of the curve, there seem to be patients, they actually doing well for a prolonged period of time. And so with that encouraging data, as we know that the AG120 has been actually moved to the phase three trial. And then, you know, we're going to hear more from this meeting. Yeah. Fair enough. Before we go on uh, to talk about that, but uh, let's hear uh, from Martin. So the AG120, or now it's called Ivuzidinib, which already is approved, by the way, for AML uh, or some forms of AML. Uh, tolerable, not tolerable, your experience. So I, I have to confess, I don't have really any experience with the IDH1. I tried to get the phase one in the center, but I couldn't. Um, it was, uh, but the, the data from AML, that it has this kind of a uh, this differentiation syndrome, which has pleural effusions, pericardial effusions, hypotension, kind of a capillary leak syndrome-like presentation. It will be kind of a question for the phase one in Andrew. You guys probably didn't see that. We did not see that yeah, in the clinical space. Case. Yeah, right. if anything, I think that the, the safety profile was actually incredibly respectful, uh, meaning that these patients tolerating very well. And the some very minor, you know, GI's, you know, a toxicity, but on the other hand, it's very hard to even attribute whether it's truly drug related or not. I, I totally agree. If anything, our hands-on experience has been really rather very positive. The drug is super well tolerated. If anything, probably some nausea, some vomiting, some diarrhea. But in general, people can really lead with their life without necessarily much of a limitation per se. Um, let's go back, however, again to the phase uh, one slash, uh, you know, the 1A, if I want to call it, with the cohort of the cholangiocarcinoma carcinoma that was already reported uh, in uh, Lancet Gastroenterology and Hepatology. And Andrea, one of the things that uh, uh, sometimes, you know, patients ask us this all the time, did my tumor shrink? Tumors did not shrink much on the uh, ivozidinib. Your thoughts on that? So I generally tell patients, if a tumor doesn't really shrink, and if it's stable, still a good news because tumor by default will grow. So we control it and achieve quality of life and as long as we can, I was still thinking that's a winning strategy. So now patients are accepting, you know, what we call living with cancer, you know, stable disease. So generally now patient don't really, you know, frown upon if they say, oh, you have stable disease, they accept it as, you know, sort of a treatment benefit. Fair enough. And if anything, let's translate that, uh, what nicely uh, Andrea said. Teresa, biologically, uh, why Ivozidinib 
we should not necessarily expect it to shrink tumors, even though it's definitely making people, people do great. But uh, tell us about that. But, yeah, it seems it, there's some biopsies in the in the in the phase one, and it yeah. seems that that uh, this stabilization it correlates with some changes in the histology of the tumor. I think uh, again this is good because uh, if we stop the tumor, that, that's good news. This is second line or third line uh, treatment, so that's good. And then also because the safety profile is so so good, maybe we can think in the future to add something else. Maybe why not to think that. It could be a potential synergistic effect with other drugs, with other yeah. uh, strategies. Now, if anything, we're hearing uh, very important points is that at the end of the day, the um, uh, Ivzidenib is a, uh, 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 you know, it's an oncolytic inhibitor and it's not necessarily it's oncolytic, i.e. the tumors can stabilize based on the tumor not growing, and maybe there are certain alterations exactly as Teresa is suggesting that could be happening within the tumor, but it's not necessarily about size. And this actually brings a very important point to our patients. How do we assess the uh, uh, outcome of their uh, disease and how they are doing is not necessarily by bigger, smaller, but rather by the perspective of how they are doing. This is very important clinically, exactly as we just heard from Andrea a second ago. And number two is, yes, this could be supported by or kind of, you know, uh, explained by the radiologic outcome, which is more like a benchmark to tell us that the tumor is stable, which is a great news because we don't expect tumor necessarily to shrink with the ivozidinib. And understandably, on top of that is, yes, maybe some of the, what we spoke much earlier about in regard to tumor markers, there could be some alterations, but not necessarily that it will be the driver, as we heard all of us, it's not necessarily a dependent marker per se.